Welcome to the Investor News. In today's video, Jim Rickards talks about the current economic situation, inflation, Fed interest rate hike, and taxes. Listen to what he has to say. But the bigger question is, why on earth is the Fed raising rates when the U.S. economy is on the brink of recession? When the U.S. economy is hanging by a thread, you don't raise rates in a weak environment. You raise rates when, you know, the economy is hot, unemployment's you know, lower than it is, but inflation is taking off, things look speculative, and then you raise rates to cool it down a little bit, and then when the market pulls down, unemployment goes up, inflation falls, then you ease, then you cut rates. And the Fed never leads the markets. The Fed always follows the markets. The Fed's always working with a lag. So why on earth are they raising rates in a, uh, a difficult, challenging economic environment? And the answer is they're doing it for the wrong reasons. They are desperately trying to raise rates so they can cut them in the next recession. Yeah. The history is that you need to cut rates three or 400 basis points, three or 4%, in other words, to get the U.S. out of a recession. And typically the way it works is you go into a recession at, you know, six and a half percent interest rates. You cut them 3% down to three and a half, maybe a little more. And then that's enough to get the economy out of the recession. Well, how do you cut 300 basis points when you're only at 25 basis points? Well, you can't, obviously. They're trying to raise rates so they can cut them. I say this is like hitting yourself in the head with a hammer because it feels good when you stop. But the Fed's conundrum is how do you raise rates enough so that you can cut them in the next recession without causing the recession you're trying to prevent? So that's the conundrum. And I think the answer is you can't do it. They're going to cause the recession. The Fed is not neutral when it comes to raising rates. They are biased in favor of raising rates. So when they, it's not the case, when they wake up in the morning, they're not asking themselves, you know, do I want to raise rates? Do I not want to raise rates? What's the data, data dependent, all this stuff. They wake up and say, I want to raise rates. Can I? In other words, just because they want to raise rates doesn't mean the coast is clear. So I analogize this to a little kid who's trying to steal money from mom's wallet. You know, if mom's looking, they won't take it. But if mom's out in the backyard, they'll go grab some money. So the Fed will raise rates whenever they think they can get away with it. So they want to raise rates. They can't always raise rates if they think things are iffy or uh, the markets don't expect it or financial conditions are already too tight for other reasons. They won't do it. But if the coast is clear, they will. When you throw out a phrase like world taxation, and we talked a little bit earlier about uh, world money, you know, the SDR and the initial reaction on the part of some readers is to roll their eyes and go, well, there goes Jim again with all his crazy conspiracy theories. But these are not conspiracy theories. Again, I, I make the point. This is very, very important. This is all documented. This is all happening. You can go to these websites. You can attend these meetings. You can look at these working papers. It's all real. Now, as far as world taxation are concerned, we, we said earlier they love these crazy acronyms that no one uh, understands unless you're, you're expert on all this. But the key phrase here is, BEPS, B-E-P-S. That stands for base erosion and profit shifting. So base erosion and profit shifting are the bad things the corporations do to get out of paying taxes. And the governments are going to lead an attack on BEPS, an uh, attack on base erosion and profit shifting. And this is all being directed by the G20. And of course, the G20 is uh, this world leadership. It's basically the board of directors of the world. That's the easiest way to describe it. The G20 operates like a board of directors, but they don't have a big staff and directorate. But what they do is they farm out these projects to different existing agencies. It could be the United Nations. It could be the IMF. But we have another group called the OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, based in Paris. Uh, this is a kind of a rich country's uh, think tank. And the G20 have given the OECD the task of coordinating and implementing BEPS, the BEPS project. And the way it works is, let's say you're, let's say you have an invention, but you invented in the United States. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Well, if you patent that invention and license it for royalties and all those royalties come to the United States, you're going to pay U.S. tax on it. But what if you take the invention and contribute the intellectual property to an offshore company, and then that company then does all the global licensing, and now all the licensing fees go into Dublin instead of Seattle, and you're not paying any tax there because you got a special deal with the Irish government. Well, that's the kind of thing that's going on. Many, many more uh, complicated examples than that, but that's a simple one that, that makes the point. The other thing that's done is you mess around with debt equity ratios. So I've got an offshore subsidiary. And, you know, instead of giving a capital, I, I borrow a gazillion dollars from it and pay them interest. Well, 
what's happening with the interest? Well, it's a deduction in the U.S. and it's income in, you know, say the Bahamas, right? So I get a nice fat tax deduction in the U.S. The money goes to a tax-free jurisdiction like the Bahamas, but I'm just taking it out of one pocket, putting it in the other, right? Because I, I own both companies and the corporations are moving this money around so fast that nobody can keep track. So what the governments have decided to do is join forces and they're going to create this global tax network. And they're going to say to every major corporation, you're going to have a global tax ID, not just your social security number, the corporate equivalent. You're going to have a global tax ID and all of your subsidiaries are going to have IDs and all of your transactions are going to have IDs. And all this information is going to be reported to a database to whatever country has jurisdiction. But then all the countries are going to share all the data using this unified ID system and then put it into one giant supercomputer and that everybody can access. So now all of a sudden, you know, Germany is going to be able to see the other side of the trade. They may know that a German corporation is paying interest, but they'll be able to learn that the interest is going to uh, an affiliate in Hong Kong that's not paying any taxes, et cetera. So they're going to have the complete picture. And then when once you have the picture, you can attack it. You can use you know anti-avoidance provisions. You can use special laws and, you know, Section 269 of the Internal Revenue Code. I mean, they're equivalents all over the world. Uh, they have the tools, but they, what they don't have is the information. Going to this BEPS project, they're going to get the information. And then they're going to combine the information and the tools, and then they're going to tax these corporations. And they'll be able to run, but they won't be able to hide. And then they're going to raise the rates. And then a lot of people say, you know, well, what's wrong with that? You know, why shouldn't they pay their fair share? And my answer is, you should pay your fair share. But what's fair? So this is a full-scale assault on the ability of corporations to legally avoid taxes, but it's going to segue into um, something that's much more punitive, much more extractive. But when you look at interest rates, you have to distinguish between nominal rates and real rates. Now, I'll give you an example. In 1980, I got my first mortgage on a condo in New York, and I paid 13%. And my mother cried. I mean, her first mortgage was like 3%. And here I am paying 13% on mortgage. My mother was upset. She thought that was the, like a dumb decision. But I said, Mom, I'm paying 13% interest, but inflation is 15% and taxes are 50%. So my after-tax cost of funding is 7, inflation is 15, my real interest rate is negative 8. The bank is paying me to borrow because I get to pay them back in cheaper dollars. Whereas today, even with, say, a 4% mortgage, if inflation is only 1.5, which it is, that's a positive real rate of 2.5. So when I borrowed at 13%, the real rate was negative five. Today, when you borrow at four and a half percent, the real rate is positive two or two and a half. So nominal rates are at an all-time low, but real rates are very high. And that's what drives economic decision-making, and that's what drives economy. And one of the problems that, that economists and policymakers are wrestling with is how do you get real rates negative? Because that's what stimulates borrowing. If, if I think I can go borrow money, and pay it back in cheaper dollars so that the real cost is negative. I actually get free money from the bank or the bank pays me to borrow. That's what a negative interest rate means. That's supposed to be a prod or a stimulus to more investment, more R&D and more consumption and more economic activity and higher aggregate demand. I have bad news for you. If you're not rich by now, you're screwed. And if you're in debt, you're even double screwed. How so, you might wonder. Well, the sad truth is that you're working your whole life to make someone else rich. The mega corporations, the banks, the politicians, everyone is getting richer. They get your money. And what is even worse, they get your time. They get your life. You are not even in a rat race. You're in a financial prison. But what could a solution for you look like? Honestly, I don't know, but I know what a solution for me would look like. It's very simple. I use whatever money I have and I multiply it with 1,000. This could make my life much easier and probably yours as well. If you have $1,000 available and multiply this with 1,000, I believe that this could solve some financial issue for the one or the other. Of course, if you're ugly, you would have to multiply it with much more than 1,000. My name is Marco Stan, and this is what I decided to do. I decided to 1,000x my money. This is not a joke. I know what you may be thinking. You know, what, what, what is this guy talking about? You know, how should this work? This is not possible. Well, I made a detailed video where I laid out my plan. 
And some clever folks might even want to look at this plan and copy it and do exactly what I do. This is just a little hint on the side. You have two options. You leave, you forget what you have seen. You do whatever you're doing and you hope that somehow you get some other results. Good luck with that. Or you click the link below the video. You enter your email address because I'm not showing this to everybody. You at least watch my video on how I plan to 1000x my money. The choice is yours. Make the right choice. Join me. See what a different future you could have. See at least how I intend, how I plan to do the 1000x. So click on the link below. Enter your email address and I see you on the other side. Your Markus Dahn.